working. Good morning and welcome to John McMillan Presbyterian Church on this Sunday in June. And thank you so much to our celebration ringers for playing this morning under the direction of Carolyn Bro. It is good to have you blessing us with music on this summer Sunday. I am Samantha Coggins, associate pastor here at the church. And our senior pastor, Reverend Jeff Tyndall, will be preaching today. Whether you have been worshiping here for many, many years, or you have returned after a time away, or if you're worshiping with us online, or if this is your first time worshiping with us, it is good to have you here. I don't believe that there are any announcements to commend to your attention this morning, except that during our worship service today, we will be commissioning those in our congregation who will be serving for Vacation Bible School and who will be going on mission trips to Chiapas, Mexico and to Chicago this summer. So we will participate together in that commissioning that I will lead later in our service today. And it's good to see many faces here of those who will be, who will be serving in those capacities this summer. With that, I'd like to um, invite up Emily Shubilla for a brief minute for mission before we continue with our worship this morning. Come on up, Emily. Good morning, everyone. It's so nice to see you all. Um, I actually have the announcements this time. So my first announcement is it is so exciting to say that tomorrow is our first day of VBS. Um, there are still some things that we need to, to get done. So if you could stay and help clean up the chairs and decorate, I heard that there are sandwiches and some snacks um, for us to all join together and do that. That would be great. I'm so excited to open our doors tomorrow for kids of our community and children of our congregation to spread the word of God to them. So that will be happening today after church. The second thing that I would like to share with you is we are going to try something a little new um, over the summer. We don't have a specific kids program. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to take the corner of the, of the sanctuary there and we're going to start what we're referring to as our summer prayer ground. Some people just refer to it as a children's corner. Um, but I talked to session, session approved. We're going to try to set up a little area for them to play um, quietly and color and just have fun with me. So we're going to hang out back there together um, and worship with you still. So please bring your children to me. Let me watch them while you worship. And I hope that it is something that is fruitful and fun and something to bring them into the sanctuary with us. So that's all I got. So stay after if you can. And I'm excited for a great week and also a great summer. Thanks. Please rise in body or spirit for our call to worship this morning, which will be preceded by our new tradition of passing of the peace, according to your bulletin and the screens. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let us pass the peace of Christ to each other.
word to each other and return to your seats to continue in our worship service this morning. Siblings in Christ, do not be afraid. God hears our cries when we are lost. Do not be afraid. God does not leave us abandoned. Do not be afraid. God is with us now and always. May be seated. Siblings in Christ, we have died to sin, yet we continue to live in it. But God's grace abounds so we might move past our sins. Trusting that promise, let us confess together using the words found in your bulletin and on the screen. Gracious God, we try to follow your word, to put others above ourselves, to remember that we are all bound together as your beloved children, to seek the common good instead of our own interests. But it is so easy for our lesser selves to get the better of us. We succumb to jealousy, vindictiveness, callousness, and indifference. In your mercy, send your healing to people we have hurt and to our own misguided souls so that we may follow you once more. We are united in Christ's life, death,
death and resurrection. Christ has saved us from sin so that we might live in the presence of God. Thanks be to Jesus Christ. be seated. At this time, I invite you to come forward here to the steps and stand right here where I am standing. If you are participating in any way this year in Vacation Bible School or the mission trips to Chiapas, Mexico, and Chicago, please come on forward for our commissioning at this point in our worship service. Thank you. Siblings in Christ, today we commission these folks who stand before you in our congregation who will serve as volunteers for VBS this week here at John McMillan and who will travel to Chiapas, Mexico and to Chicago this summer to work alongside our sisters and brothers in faith there. Our book of order says the great ends of the church are the proclamation of the gospel for the salvation of humankind the shelter, nurture, and spiritual fellowship of the children of God, the maintenance of divine worship, the preservation of the truth, the promotion of social righteousness, and the exhibition of the kingdom of heaven to the world. The call of Christ is to willing, dedicated discipleship. Our discipleship is a manifestation of the new life we enter through Jesus. Discipleship Discipleship is a gift and a commitment, an offering and a responsibility. To our volunteers, the grace bestowed on you in baptism is sufficient for your calling because it is God's grace. By God's grace, we are saved and enabled to grow in faith and to commit our lives in ways that serve Jesus. God has called you to particular service. God has called to Chiapas, Dan, Caitlin, and Megan. God has called to Chicago, Jeremiah, Megan, Emily, Caitlin, Russell, and Ella. And God has called many folks to serve VBS. <laughs> Elizabeth, Heidi, and Donna. I believe I have named all who are gathered here today. We are grateful for all of you individually, for the myriad of ways that you will serve this congregation this summer, how you will give of your time and your energy and your gifts. We recognize, too, that there are many who are not gathered with us today in church, but who will also serve in these ministries this summer. Let us pray together. Faithful God, in baptism you claimed us, and by your Holy Spirit you are working in our lives, empowering us to live a life worthy of our calling. We thank you for leading these disciples to serve here at JMPC, for VBS, for Chiapas, and Chicago at this time. Establish each of them as individuals and as a collective in your truth. Guide them by your Holy Spirit. 
that in your service they might grow in faith, hope, and love, and be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, to whom, with you and the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Friends in Christ, Donna, Heidi, Anna, Elizabeth, Jim, Ella, Russell, Jeremiah, Megan, Caitlin, Emily, Joe, Stan, Sarah, Pam, and Susie, you are commissioned to service in this congregation. Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of Jesus with your hearts open to the ways that God is already moving in the context you will serve, giving thanks to God for the new friends and connections you will make that will bless your lives. Amen. You may be seated. Will you pray with me, please? Give ear to our words, O Lord. Give heed to our prayers. Listen to the sound of our cries, the music of our joy, the affirmation of our praise, the regret of our confessions. You are our King and our God, and it is only to you we can pray. We gather this Sunday morning, creatures of your image, gathering in your name, seeking communion with you and the peace that comes with it. As we sing, pray, respond, and listen, your spirit moves among us, reaching out, seeking contact with each mind, heart, and soul. Lord, you have taught us to pray not only for ourselves, but for people everywhere. We ask that you inspire the whole church with your power, unity, and peace. Grant that all who trust you may obey your word and live together in love, despite the differences of our theologies, despite the differences of our denominations, despite the differences in the way we worship. We ask that you allow us to come together so that we can demonstrate your love to the world around us. Lead all the nations in the way of justice and goodwill. Direct those who govern that they may rule fairly, maintain order, uphold those in need, and defend oppressed people, that the world may claim your rule and know true peace. Lord, we pray today for our president, our Congress, our Supreme Court and all the governors of the, the, the United States, along with all the leaders of the communities. We pray for the leaders of the world around us, particularly those in Russia and Ukraine and Uganda, as they try to bring peace to conflict. And we ask that you let them feel your presence so that they can bring true peace. We ask that you awaken all people to the danger we have inflicted upon the earth. Implant in each of us a reverence for the creation that you have given us, that we may preserve its delicate balance for all coming generations so that our children, our grandchildren, their grandchildren, and all the grandchildren who follow may have a place to live, food to eat, shelter, and water. Give grace to all who proclaim the gospel through word and sacrament and deeds of mercy. And by their teaching and example, may they reveal your love for all the people. Lord, we pray today for our missionaries, to the children who will come to us during Vacation Bible School, and to the people that we will meet in Chiapas, and the people we will meet in Chicago. Those missionaries will proclaim the gospel through word, if nothing else, and deeds of mercy, certainly. And we ask that they be given the power to teach by example uh, the gospel to the people that they come across. Comfort and relieve, O Lord, all who are in trouble, sorrow, poverty, sickness, or grief, especially those known to us. Lord, we pray in particular this morning for Bonnie Timko, 
Karen's sister who has been hospitalized in Columbus. We pray for Pam Dobis' friend, Jay Szynski, who is battling cancer. We're praying for Jim and Judy Wilson's friend, Marley Dallas, who has grave health concerns. We are praying for Carolyn Ellis, who was hospitalized this week. We're offering prayers of strength and comfort for Jean Haddad, a co-worker of Emily Little's, and her husband, Mark, who is facing the possibility of bypass surgery, and for Emily's cousin, Laura, who needs major surgery to treat a resurgence of cervical cancer. We're also praying for John Patera, who is a friend of Charlie Previs, who is having health issues from a heart transplant. Heal these people, Lord, in mind, body, or circumstance, working in them by your grace, wonders beyond all they may dream or hope. Lord, bring to our remembrance all those who, having served you on earth, now sing your praises eternally. May their endurance give us courage and their faithfulness give us hope. Lord in heaven, please listen to all those who are praying to you now. Help us all to remember that you are there and you are listening. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ who taught us this prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Will you pray with me, please? Lord, we have gathered here today to worship you and to commission people to be your witnesses in the world around us, to hear the wonderful music that's been offered to us by our celebration ringers and to pray devoutly for your intervention in our lives and in our world. And so we know you are here with us. So we ask that you now touch our hearts and our minds so that we can hear the word the way you would have it heard, so that we can understand the word the way you would have it understood, and so we can live the word the way you would have it lived. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So one of the things that I get asked a lot is how do I choose a sermon topic each Sunday? There are a few different ways this can be done. There are, of course, seasonal themes, Advent, Christmas, Lent, Easter, Pentecost. Then there are celest selected theological subjects that appear in our Presbyterian calendar each Sunday, things like Trinity Sunday, Christ the King Sunday, Transfiguration Sunday, Baptism of the Lord Sunday. I notice that when people have the Presbyterian calendar and they see those theological, theological suggestions, there's a reduction in the number of people who come to hear the sermon. More often, I explore particular topics of immediate concern in the community or the world around us. Terrible things like mass shootings or weather disasters. Some things that make us think, how can God be involved in any of that? Other times, I ask the congregation to choose a topic. We did that a couple of years ago. Maybe you remember the What Does the Bible Say About Blank Sermon series. Another is to teach a lesson of encouragement to the congregation. The last two weeks I have done that, about passing our faith on to the next generation and mission work in the world around us. Apparently it worked because of look at all the people who are up here in front of us going off to do mission work this summer. But when nothing in particular pops into my head, I go to the dreaded lectionary. 52 suggested Old and New Testament passages that are suggested for each Sunday of the year. And then typically I read it, try to think of something interesting to say about the passage, read it to you on Sunday and tell you what I think it means. This week was one of those. I had no particular topical inspiration to share, and so I went to the lectionary. I read all the suggestions, and today's text stood out to me for some reason, and so I picked it. An Old Testament passage from Genesis. Part two of the story of Abraham, Sarah, Hagar, Ishmael, and Isaac. So here is an admittedly superficial summary of what comes before our passage. Abraham and Sarah have left their home in Ur because God told them to go. God promised Abraham and Sarah that they would be the patriarch and matriarch of a great nation, of more people than the grains of the sand. The problem was, Sarah couldn't seem to get pregnant. And this goes on for many years. Now, Sarah wants to make sure that God's promise to Abraham is going to be fulfilled, and so she orders her slave Hagar, an Egyptian woman, to bear a child with Abraham so that Abraham can get started on his great nation with more people than the grains of the sand. And Hagar gives birth to Ishmael. About 13 years later, Sarah gets pregnant. It's a miracle. And gives birth to Isaac. And Isaac is now three years old. And so we go to our text comes from Genesis 21, verses 8 through 21. Listen to and hear the word of the Lord. 
The child Isaac grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named after you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder, along with the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, Do not let me look on the death of my child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I picked this passage, and what I do every Monday or Tuesday once I've got the passage selected, I send it off to the staff so that we can talk about it at our Wednesday, Wednesday staff meeting. It wasn't long after I had sent out the memo to the staff that we were going to preach about this this Sunday, Samantha came into my office and asked something like, why did you pick that? There's a lot going on there, Jeff. Yeah, there is. It's not a nice story, is it? It's from the Old Testament where there are a lot of not nice stories. The Old Testament is a part of our Bible that is particularly foreign to our modern sensibilities. It's a testament I fear that is unfamiliar to many of us here at John McMillan Presbyterian Church. And if I am right, we are certainly not alone. In speaking of the Old Testament, Philip Yancey, in his book, The Bible Jesus Read, described what he believed to be the two main barriers to our understanding of the Old Testament. This is what he says. It doesn't always make sense. In what sense it does make offends our modern ears. For these reasons, the Old Testament, three-fourths of our Bible, often goes unread. How can we make sense of the strange Old Testament? And how does it apply to our lives today? In short, is the Old Testament worth the effort to read and understand it? The answer is yes, it's worth it, but reading it and understanding it takes a lot of work. And so we need to read it in context and understand who wrote it and what they were trying to tell us. We need to bring it into a modern context, which is frankly really difficult for most of us. But Dolores Williams, a black Presbyterian theologian, some years ago likened Hagar to the lives of contemporary black women, bringing it into the modern context for them. She wrote a book called Sisters in the Wilderness, and it's a fascinating read. 
Getting into the Old Testament stories is not an easy thing to do, but they are there, and they are part of our Bible, and we need to ask, why are they there? Why are they so important that they have survived millennia and are still studied by Jews and Christians alike? By studying the Old Testament takes a lot of work. So I did a lot of work. I did a good bit of reading, including parts of William's book, and learned a good bit about our text's history and interpretation. And here is the thing I learned when I read all those things. It is not a nice story. Nobody thinks it is. Sarah, Abraham, and God really don't come off very well in this passage. Sarah, we can understand maybe because she's an overprotective mother. Abraham, maybe we can understand because he's a cuckolded husband who just doesn't want to hear anymore from Sarah. But God? What is God up to here? Well, let's get to work. Let me fill out the story a little bit so that you can understand what the passage says. First of all, Isaac is now weaned. That means he's three years old. And in those days, if you made it to three, you probably were going to go the distance because a lot of kids died before they were three. And so there are two kids in the household. There's Ishmael, who's probably 13, well on his way to adulthood. And there's Isaac, who is newborn. So they kind of have to wait three years to see if Isaac is going to make it. And once Sarah sees that Isaac is going to make it, well, Ishmael is expendable. But anyway, Abraham is throwing a party to celebrate Isaac's weaning. Sarah looks out and sees Ishmael having a good time with his baby brother, and now she's worried because she realizes that Isaac is going to survive and presumably get everything that Abraham has as an inheritance, including God's blessing. But the problem is, is Ishmael is still there. He's the firstborn, so he's going to get two-thirds of it, according to the law in those days. So Sarah is not happy. She doesn't want Ishmael to get any of it. So in Sarah's mind, Ishmael and Hagar have outworn their usefulness to Abraham, and it is time for them to go. So they must be cast out of Abraham's household, kind of a death sentence in those days. Abraham doesn't want to send them away. Ishmael is his son. He loves him. But God intervenes on Sarah's behalf and tells Abraham, cast them out. What? This is the part where you're reading the Old Testament passage in your year through the Bible uh, process, and you say, what? This seems so wrong. Why would God do such a thing? What have Hagar and Ishmael done to deserve being cast out of Abraham's household? The answer, nothing. Nothing at all. Now, some scholars have taken the time to find evil intent on Ishmael's part that makes it okay and somehow righteous and just that he is cast out of the family. But hear this. The original Hebrew text in the scrolls from which we get our Old Testament says nothing about that. Nothing. You see, people over time try to change things a little bit so it's a little more easy for us to hear the story. So why does God support the exile of these two innocents? Well, there are a lot of different views about this, but I like the one offered by Reverend Karen Schiffendecker, who is an Old Testament scholar, who points out that God's activity in the world often seems to us humans to be a little unfair. I mean, Isaac gets all of Abraham's inheritance, right? He is the chosen one. But there is a downside to Isaac's inheritance, isn't there? Schiffendecker puts it this way. The chosen people are called to high standards and difficult trials. They are blessed in order to be a blessing. 
They are a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. It's not an easy thing to be chosen. It is both a privilege and a responsibility. Abraham's progeny are not going to have an easy go of it. You doubt that? Read the Old Testament. But what of Ishmael? Well, he might be cast out of Abraham's household, but he is not abandoned. Ishmael gets a promise, too. God tells Abraham, don't worry about Ishmael because I will take care of him. And God does. Hagar and Ishmael go off into the wilderness. And when they struggle, God hears Ishmael. God speaks to Hagar, the Egyptian slave. And as the text says, God is with the boy. Ishmael goes on to become a Bedouin hunter until he marries an Egyptian woman, and his progeny do in fact become a great nation, though without all the responsibility that comes along with God's covenant with Isaac. And what's really interesting about this is that while Jews and Christians trace their heritage back to Abraham, Muslims trace their heritage back to Abraham as well. We do it through Isaac, they do it through Ishmael. Interesting. Interesting. So where am I going with this? What does this mean? Because that's what we are supposed to ask the Old Testament. Not so much about, did this really happen? Is this historical fact? But what does it mean? Why is this story being passed along to us? What are we to learn from it? Why do we study it? And so again, I agree with Schiffendecker that one lesson from this passage is this. Being chosen, according to the story, does not entitle one to exclusive claim on God's presence. Hear that again. Being chosen, according to this story, does not entitle one to exclusive claim on God's presence. Isaac was the chosen one. But God was with Ishmael, too. So what does all this mean? So we are gathered here, and we consider ourselves chosen because we are disciples of Jesus. We are supposed to be a blessing to the world. Like Isaac, we have responsibilities. We are meeting some of those responsibilities in the coming weeks with VBS this week, the trip to Chiapas, the trip to Chicago. Isaac's job was to let the world know about the one true God, and we too are supposed to let the world know about the one true God. And we believe God is with us to the end of the age. Jesus told us that. But while we are disciples of Jesus, that does not give us an exclusive claim on the presence of God in our lives and in our communities. This text tells us that even folks who are not disciples of Jesus also live in the presence of God. God is with them too. Just like God was with the boy. We are not superior we are just specially called to a particular way of life and task that gives us a distinct future. And so we need to beware of judging others with whom God is also present, who aren't called to that. They are called to something else. Their promise might be different. But God is with them too, according to this text. And when I read this passage, I believe it has a message for our world today. Jealousy, perceived superiority, and exclusion are our tribal nature. And boy, are we involved in it now. And just because we are in one tribe doesn't mean that God isn't with the other tribe. Because God is. What humanity often lacks is the recognition, recognition that God is present with all of us. And maybe that's the lesson we're supposed to spread 
when we speak the gospel to people we meet. Maybe that's the good news that Jesus wants us to teach. Maybe this story is part of that lesson. And lastly, something I re- else I read from Reverend Amanda Beckheisen, who says this. The difference between Isaac and Ishmael, then, is not so much closeness, but calling. Isaac and his progeny were called to the task of being the means through which God would bless the nations. They were to show and tell God's love for the whole world and ultimately to participate in God's redemptive work by being the peoples whom the Messiah of the world would come. These narratives are in Genesis to remind us of this. God loves the Hagars and the Ishmaels of our world. God hears their cries, sees their sufferings, and brings about their redemption. This is the gospel story. And the invitation for those of us who, uh, with God's people is to attend to, bless, and embody God's love and care to those outside the community of Christian faith, particularly those who are most vulnerable. Just as God loves the Hagars and Ishmaels of the world, so should we. This is an important story from the Old Testament, and we need to learn it. That being chosen according to this story does not entitle us to exclusive claim on God's presence. We need to remember that God was with the boy. God is with us. God is with all of us. Amen.
the affirmation of faith that appears in the bulletin on the screen. In life and in death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, with whom alone we worship and serve. Siblings in Christ, everything we have is a gift from God. The purpose of these gifts is to allow for the care of those around us, to carry out the mission and ministries we are assigned according to our callings, and to proclaim God's goodness to the world. I invite you now to consider what will you offer to these tasks in terms of your treasure. At this time in our worship service, I invite you to offer your tithes and offerings. God of unending gifts, we praise you for your abundant goodness. As you are generous, we want to be generous too. May the gifts we bring in our time, treasure, talent, and testimony extend your generosity into the world so that all people might be made whole by your goodness and grace. Amen.
One of the things we need to remember about the Old Testament is that that's the Bible Jesus read. Those are the stories he was told as he was a boy growing up in Nazareth. And perhaps the ones that taught him the lessons that he spread when he began teaching after his baptism. So they're important stories. The second thing is I find to, that I can be a little bit uplifted by this difficult and troublesome story in the Old Testament. When I see people who cry out in pain because they have been cast out of the church because of their color, because of their sexual orientation, because of their beliefs, because of their politics. And yet, those people who seem to have read this story know that despite the fact they've been cast out of whatever community they found themselves to be in, God is with them, is present in their lives, hears them, speaks to them, promises them, and blesses them. Thanks be to God for that. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And have fun at DBS. Amen.